welcome to the Schubert Lab, or should I say really the Schubert Pub. Um, we've been asking the question all day today in the lab, what did Schubert get up to with his mates? He got up to things like that, singing drinking songs around the piano. I hope their pianist was as good as ours, Richard Sisson. Brian Eubold is with me. Susanna Clark is listening and watching indeed from Boston, Massachusetts. And we were joined also by a couple of very august members of the Radio 3 Music Department to help us out in that chorus. Uh, Richard Sisson, what were we singing? Uh, we were singing something <laughs> called Trinklied. There are a number of these Trinklied. Uh, and also Punchlied, which is a punch song. Um, interestingly, uh, many of them we discovered are in C major. I think it's as if uh, Schubert is, uh, I don't know, no black notes, I would just <laughs> do the white notes. Um, interesting, interesting, because I think C major was a special key for Schubert. I mean, Brian will bear us out, but I think uh, the, the great C major symphony, of course, yes. uh, the wonder of fantasies in C, mm -hmm. um, the quintet, of course, is in C as well. You know, Indeed. So uh, those are three monster works. Well, so there is a connection then, Brian. Um, I was going to say the connection between what we've just performed and the string quintet in C major. That might perhaps be taking it a bit far for <laughs> any <laughs> listeners at home to believe. But you know, the point is, uh, Susanna and Brian, there is a connection between Schubert's drinking songs and, and the rest of what he did. He was, you know, he was being as much a composer writing songs like that as he was writing symphonies, Brian. He was indeed, uh, yes. I suppose you could say that the last movement of the string quintet has a certain dance element in it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Susanna. I think uh, the point is that, uh, you know, you did a very fine demonstration of a Schubertiad. And the next thing that comes up might very well be something else that he wrote uh, that day or that week and could be a very erudite piece. So I'm sure the mixture was all there. Now, again, look, Susanna, um, earlier this afternoon, we were uh, touching on the idea that these were basically all male groups uh, of Schubert's friends, but there were women involved somehow. Um, I've got a, an amazing thing uh, that was uh, found in 1826, right? Um, Schubert went to a sausage ball. Uh, a, a Wurstabau, and a Wurstabau was an evening of dancing where sausages were served to the men by the women. The sausages strung in pairs and eaten hot were called Frankfurters in Vienna, and Vienna sausages in uh, Frankfurt. Were women only, as part of a, Sch a Schubert social circle, reduced to the level of, and I use the phrase in the entirely literal sense, sausage servers? Uh, I don't, well, not necessarily. I mean, I think uh, they all enjoyed playing a lot of uh, games and charades, and so that would be like, well, you know, one example. They played lots of riddles. Uh, there's also times where, for example, uh, Kupel uh, Wieser uh, painter, depicted yeah. um, one of the um, uh, Schubertiads where they uh, did the fall of ma man, and there was a woman there who plays the role of Eve. Uh, so, you know, I think they... Uh, um, uh, did what they could to, you know, make these sort of real life but also allegorical events. Um, uh, Brian Newbold, uh, there are two twin uh, poles, really. Uh, on one hand, Schober, th this, this friend of Schubert's. Who was this guy, uh, Schober, who uh, some people think led Schubert astray? Well, Schober, in that charade uh, that Susanna was talking about, he was a serpent, and, and some think that was quite appropriate. <laughs> uh, he was... Do I come he was um, a lifelong friend, or almost a lifelong friend, who um, was a very, very close, and his influence was beneficial, certainly as a second-rate poet. Mm. But uh, yes, he, it is thought that he did lead Schubert astray in his last few years. Well, we're all in danger of being led astray by the beauty of what uh, Richard Sisson is, is playing. In, in the way that Schubert might have done at some of these social gatherings, he was uh, required sometimes to be Mr. Piano Man to, to underscore conversation. That's right, yes, he did. And sometimes he got absolutely worn out by the end of the evening. <laughs> if he wasn't, maybe a little sozzled as well. He was. Uh, let's just listen to Richard and he'll explain what he's playing shortly. Uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful. Now, the idea, you know, you would think about that as a kind of vamp to Brian and, and my August conversation there, but, the, the, you know, there's real sophistication in this supposedly light music of Schubert. Uh, yes, he wrote a series of often marches and dances, and these were, um, that I was playing uh, was from the Volz Sentimental, uh, which is a series of, uh, of waltzes all linked together so they could be played without a break for dancing. But even, even in these simple pieces, uh, he often does something of genius. And I wonder, can I show you exactly Absolutely. what's going on? Um, it, the key of this piece is A major. So you get uh, the tonic A major. Okay. And then you'll get the subdominant D major. And then you'll have uh, E7, which is the dominant major. Uh, yeah. With the seventh in. And then back to the into A. And what he does is he introduces extra notes into the give, give suspension. So you start with A, and then you go to D, but he introduces the major seventh. 
that note, which is very poignant. He resolves that to the B, which gives us D6. And then he keeps that B as part of the A chord. And then it goes, he keeps that down to A. And then the A is part of the resolution of the E7 chord. And then we're back to C. But this is the stroke of genius. Yeah. From the A chord, he makes that an A7 chord. And then goes to D, but he makes it of the seventh. So you get... So ah okay that so it's chord. so it's a resolution which isn't quite a resolution. Look, uh, Richard, as, as you were describing that, the, the, I could see the the harmonic tension etched on your face. Let's just <laughs> let's just hear that in 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 the real time of performance. magic. Um, th Susanna Clark, th this brings up the idea that, that uh, because as Richard's saying that, that, you know, we think there could have been a reason that Schubert invented harmonies like that. Now, some people have said there's a relationship between uh, who Schubert is as a musician and who he was as, uh, who he was in terms of his uh, his close relationships, whether they were with men or women. Susanna, does it simply make a difference that the idea of, of who Schubert was, was closest to romantically it, when we're listening to his music, do you think? I, well, I think it can un help us to understand um, you know, or how to interpret uh, his music and why in a passage like that uh, that we've just heard, for example, that could also uh, fit with words that deal with some kind of empathy for what you might call the marginalized characters uh, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. And Schubert was particularly good at adept at sort of uh, portraying a kind of empathy uh, for people who were often left out of society in some kind of way. So, so, so I think that's an important part so, of so the you equation. Think, do you think he was left outside of society because he felt that uh, the, the people he wanted to be with didn't conform to what society uh, wanted him to do? I guess marriage and kids. I think, well, that's a highly controversial issue, but I would, I would say yes. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's the case. He had a very early love of his life in around 18... Uh, 14, 15. Theresa uh, Gould, this woman. yeah. Uh, but there are sort of many hints, nothing explicit, that he might have gotten up to uh, other things with men well, there later are, in his the, life. There are, Brian Newell. I mean, the, the accounts, the letters that he, the, 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 uh, frankly, all of the circle write to one another are, are full of what we would now think was very romantic language between men. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It is, but then I think that was probably just typical of the time, and we were talking this morning about the, um, this, the, the, the relations between men were rather cl closer. Uh, at that time, and people would open their hearts to men friends in the way they probably don't today. So what about the relationship with the music then? Susanna's offered a, a really interesting way of thinking about Schubert as outsider and that idea of empathy, connecting with these sorts of harmonic aspirations in Schubert's music. Do, it, do you go along with that? It's an interesting idea, but I think one would have to do a very thorough study of Schubert's harmony through all the works, <laughs> but I'm no doubt well, Susanna has been doing this. Susanna, having written a book called Analyzing yep. Schubert, yep. give us a bit of evidence. <laughs> Well, I would uh, use one particular example, which is an explicit uh, homoerotic poem by Goethe, which is uh, Ganymede. And if you compare Schubert's setting to Reichardt's setting, there's a place in the, um, the sort of cornerstone of the poem which says, where are we going, where are we going, up into the sky, up into the sky, mm. when um, the eagle uh, plucks the boy from, from the earth. Yeah. And the point there is that Schubert sets that as an ecstatic moment, whereas Reichardt set it uh, as a very awkward moment using a deceptive cadence. So that's it's one example. Susanna Clark in Boston, thank you very much indeed. I, I suspect that the true answer to this question of what Schubert actually got up to with all of his friends, we're never going to know the answer to completely, and perhaps we shouldn't either. What we do know, though, uh, is that he did uh, enjoy um, drinking and the company of friends. Of that, there's no doubt. We can all agree on that, at least. So that could be as good as close as we're going to get to an answer to the question of what Schubert got up to with his mates. Uh, look, um, Brian Newbold on our especially convened micro BBC choir, Richard Sisson at the piano. Before we hand you back to the in-tune Schubert Salon and Sean Rafferty, master of revels there at Champs Hill. Um, another drinking song for your sheer delectation.